Is the Mitchich signing finally going to happen? Is the saga finally going to end? Why the Thunder selected these two guys in their draft class and your Mailbag Monday questions all coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at Pod. Email the show, lothunderpod at gmo.com. On today's show, we're diving into the Oklahoma City Thunder possibly getting an end to the Mitchich saga after all of these years. Which Thunder player is on the hot seat following the NBA draft? Why did the Thunder select Kaysen Wallace over Grady Dick and so much more? Going to dive into all of that on today's show with your mailbag questions. But let's start with Mitchich Mania. Mitchich Mania, it's here again. Uh, You know that uh, if you follow the Thunder closely around this time, each year, Mitchich decides that he wants to dip his toe in the NBA waters, and then each year, uh, he decides not to come to the NBA, and he's had very high demands, very um, restraining demands upon uh, uh, you know his, his NBA team, which in this case right now is the Thunder with his draft rights. And I've compared him to Mike Gundy, where you know Mike Gundy always flirts with taking the Tennessee job after they fire uh, Derek Dooley, after they fire Butch Jones, after they fire Jimmy Pruitt. He's going to flirt with taking the Tennessee job uh, and leave OSU, and then never does, and just gets more money from OSU. Um, it's kind of that same way with Mitchich to this point. However, this time, it does feel more real. So in a... Series of events, we've gotten to this point right here from our good friend Christo Saltas. Um, he reported that Mitchich is determined to make his dreams come true and play in the NBA. In fact, he has lessened his salary, minutes demand, and team quality demand in order to make that happen. And then the biggest kind of alert out there is the fact that he actually flew to Oklahoma City last week and he was here. Uh, on our soil, as Sam Presti said, uh, was was meeting with OKC, and Sam Presti mentioned uh, how nice it was to finally have him kind of in the building and, and meeting with him in person, uh, which has not been a part of the steps the last couple of years. It, it seems as though this is the real deal. It seems as though a, a deal is going to get made of some sort. And so then they, their breaks off into two camps. Are, is he going to play for Oklahoma City? Will the Thunder trade him? What is the trade value for Mitchich? And that's been all the rage so far. So let's just take it one at a time. And, and this will cover a lot of your mailbag questions. So um, if you asked about Mitchich, I appreciate you interacting, but uh, here it is. Here's your Mitchich stuff. So what if he plays in OKC? Fantastic. If he plays in OKC, he's going to come off the bench. He's going to be a fantastic facilitator, a fantastic scorer off the bench uh, for, for a secondary unit that sometimes, oftentimes even struggle to score and especially struggle to score in an organized way. This not only elongates your depth, but also resolve some pressure on Shea, Giddy, and J-Dub. Like, like, instead of feeling the need to have all 48 minutes you know, taken up by having those three guys on the court, one of those three guys on the courts, the court at all times of that 48-minute stretch, you can now mix and match the Rubik's Cube of this rotation in a way that gives you maybe more minutes where they're all three together versus having to split them up and stagger them um, because you now have a, an adult in the room, so to say, with Mitchich and his pedigree and his ability to orchestrate an offense, his ability to uh, score and help others score. So that so that helps you a lot uh, in a lot of different ways if he does play in OKC. Now, the more likely path and the more interesting path would be uh, trading him. And I, I think that people are going to be fairly surprised with, with what 
the return is going to be for Mitchich. Like it's not going to be this incredible illustrious package. It's not going to be something that blows you away. It's not going to be something that you even really think about after it's done. It's, it's very easy to get hyper focused on this right now because it's like the only breadcrumb out there regarding the Thunder. But it's all said and done. It's it's going to be a blip on the radar for the Thunder specifically, and and hopefully for Mitchich, it'll be a, a, a fantastic role in a, in a contending team. But for OKC, the return on this trade is going to be like a, a couple second round picks. I, I think of the lofty expectations, like of the lofty expectations that I've seen on Twitter uh, for a Mitchich trade, the most realistic of the lofty expectations would be maybe you can convince a team that like, hey, we're going to give you Mitchich, but you've got to give uh, the draft rights to X second rounder that you just, that you just uh, drafted. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that can be, for example, a guy like Leonard Miller, who I, who I love pre-draft and also uh, maybe a guy like Jordan Walsh, like like the Celtics need a, need a kind of a point guard. Maybe Mitchich, they think that he can fit that. The Thunder love Jordan Walsh. Uh, he's been killing it in the pre-draft process. He also, I will say, killed the Celtics pre-draft process in the in, you know, 98th percentile. So like, congratulations to him. He's on the Celtics, and, and that's a great fit for him. And the Celtics probably won't want to give him up. Like Maybe you can convince him to do that for Mitchich. But ultimately, it's going to be like a couple second-round picks, and, and, and that's going to be the return for Mitchich um, in this trade. And that's okay. Because he's never played in the NBA. We know he's good in the EuroLeagues. And we know that, in my opinion, we know he's not going to be some star in the NBA. But I think that we understand he's he's going to be a quality NBA player. Uh, probably not going to be a star, not going to be an all-star, but he's going to be a quality NBA player. This is not going to be, you know, this is not going to be Grady Dick. I, I'm just saying, I'm sorry. It's not going to be Gabby Deck. See how you get confused there. Uh, you know, Gabriel Deck came over. People were kind of excited about Gabriel Deck, and then he's just he's not good. He's, he's not good NBA player. He's not a functional NBA player, and no one else wants him after he's done with the Thunder. Um, this is that's not the case here, and so that's why I don't think holding Mitchich allows his trade value to go up. So, like the third the third option here would be hold him for now, play him into December, play him into the the trade deadline area, and then you get more return on 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 Mitchich. The issue here is we kind of know what he's going to be. Like, like I do not see a world where he fails in the NBA. I think Mitchell will be a good NBA player. I also do not see a world where he's some all-star superstar player. Um, at best, he's going to be a starter. At worst, he's going to be a heavily uh, used r- rotational piece to help you um, in your bench unit. So like that's going to be his range no matter if he plays for OKC or not. And so the value on that doesn't necessarily change all that much. Like a spot starter versus a fifth starter – like it, it doesn't really change all that much no matter what he declares himself as during the first half of the season, whether that's in OKC or somewhere else. So that's why I think that there's not as much value in holding on to him and letting him play in OKC um, as people might think. It's not going to really increase or, or inflate the value that you get back in your return of the trade. The only thing that that really does would be like giving some resolution to the Thunder fans who've been invested in Mitchich for a long time. And like, at least you get to see him play. And like that's kind of your send off for Mitchich. But um, ultimately, this is going to be a trade that people look around and go, wow, I spent all this time concerning myself with Mitchich. And he went for a 2026 second rounder. He went for a 2029 second rounder. Like, wow. All right. I guess this is it. Like that's, that's to me what the value is going to be. And if it's anything higher than that, that's fantastic. Uh, But if he does play in OKC, like I saw the sentiment that like, Oh, he's not going to come off the bench. He was a, he was a year league MVP. You league superstar. The thunder are not going to start Mitchich over Jay, obviously, over Josh, over J-Dub, over, over any of these guys who they're trying to develop and trying to, to nurture. And also, uh, if they were to play him, they're not going to sacrifice, you know, Kaysen Wallace's ability to develop for Mitchich. They'll play together, and, and, and we've seen Kaysen Wallace uh, be willing to play off ball and play, as he said, as he said, he played at Kentucky four different positions. Uh, he's been willing to do that, too, in the NBA. But ultimately, I think that this ends in Mitchich being traded for a couple second round picks and, and we just kind of all take a deep breath and a sigh of relief that this is over. And we no longer have to wait up until 3 a.m. Um, looking for Mitch's news, looking for um, explanations for what is going on. I think that that's going to be kind of how this dust settles. Let me know what you think about Mitch and what he's going to bring to OKC either via trade or via um, keeping him on the roster, what you think will happen with this entire saga. But first, before we get into your mailbag questions, including why the Thunder drafted Kaysen Wallace over Grady Dick, let's talk about our good friends over at eBay Motors. eBay Motors is awesome. You can build your vision part by part with ebaymotors.com because they know that just like in sports, 
building a championship team is all about making sure that you have the right players and the perfect fit. It's the same thing when it comes to working on your vehicle. You need every fit, uh, every part to fit just right and, and make sure it's the right part for you. So the next time you need a part or an accessory for your vehicle, head on over to eBay Motors. And whenever you do uh, with eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, you can go ahead and be sure that every part will fit just right and will be the right part for your car whenever you see that green check mark by their name with the eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit. So check it out today by adding your car to my garage and then looking for that green check mark on the parts that you're looking at or your money back guaranteed because just like in sports, they understand that it has to be the perfect player, the perfect fit, the perfect match to make the win happen, including at eBay Motors. So check it out today. eBay Motors guaranteed uh, fit is only available to U.S. customers and eligible items only. Exclusions to apply. Check it out today. eBayMotors.com. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Now, look, the Mitchich news broke. Uh, so that took up the first segment. I put out the mailbag request after the rookie press conference on Saturday. We got a ton of responses. So we're going to break this into two parts. So if you don't hear your question on today's show, you will hear your question on tomorrow's show. So make sure you tune in for that as well. Uh, we'll have Monday, we'll have uh, mailbag Monday linger into, um, uh, Monday mailbag linger into Monday mailbag on a Tuesday edition. Uh, so this question from at Vlad underscore if love, why isn't Grady Dick? That's the whole question. So I'm going to interpret this question as why didn't the Thunder draft Grady Dick instead of uh, Case and Wallace? And, you know, if you listen to this podcast, I was a big fan of Grady Dick. I had in my, in my top three of draft choices for OKC uh, behind Walker and, and Hendricks. And, and I do believe that Grady Dick is more than a shooter. I, I believe that he does a lot of stuff very well besides shooting. Um, and I think that that's why the Raptors drafted him in, in this draft, in the lottery. But whenever you compare these two players, it's it's pretty interesting. And you can, and you can kind of easily see why the Thunder did this, despite you know me having him in my top three, Grady Dick in my top three of, of drafted prospects. I think that I would actually kind of recant that a little bit now um, as, as you kind of compare these two specifically. So with Jason Wallace, he spent a large chunk of the season shooting 40% from three from November, you know, the start of the college season in November, all the way through the end of uh, January, he shot 40% from three. He is a far better defender than Grady Dick. And in fact, Jason Wallace has the potential to be one of the top half of the league defenders you know, in the entire, in the entire NBA. So like, that's fantastic. I think he's a far better, to, far better playmaker than Grady Dick. I think Grady Dick is more of a connective playmaker where he keeps the offense in rhythm he, he, he understands where to go with the basketball next and, and, and who to pass it to next. But in terms of initiating offense, in terms of creating uh, for himself or others, I think that Cason Wallace has that by a mile over Grady Dick uh, in this case. I, I think that he played, with that being said, that that Cason Wallace can play on ball a lot more because he can uh, maybe get to the rim easier. Maybe he can, you know, he can orchestrate the pick and roll better. Um, I think that we saw that in college, both those things in college over Grady Dick. And... When you look at the catch and shoot numbers, Cason Wallace, for all the turnover that happened in Kentucky where he's playing four different positions, uh, they kind of didn't gel initially at Kentucky very well, and then they got it together later on as he shifted over to the point guard position and, and of course, dealt with back spasms, dealt with all that stuff that he dealt with personally. Um, you know, For all that, Cason Wallace shot 35% catch and shoot. Grady Dick shot 38% catch and shoot. And so you're sacrificing a bit on the catch and shoot. You're sacrificing a bit as a three-point shooter, but everything else ticks toward Case and Wallace. Defensive versatility, Case and Wallace. Offensive versatility, Case and Wallace. Rim finishing, Case and Wallace. Pick and roll operating, Case and Wallace. You know, playing on and off ball, Case and Wallace. Like everything shifts towards Case and Wallace besides the shooting. And so I think that that was kind of the, de the deciding factor between these two guys uh, in a vacuum and, and why uh, Leading up to the draft, I had said that I had heard that Cason Wallace was going to go top 10. I didn't know he was going to go to the Thunder top 10, or else I would have said that. But like he, I, I knew he was going to go top 10 uh, based on what I heard from other organizations. And here it is. Like Here's Cason Wallace in the top 10. And, and, and I think that after the initial sticker shock of you know moving up in the top 10 and drafting a guard and everything else, I, I think that you come back on Monday following that draft and following that rookie press conference, and you got to feel pretty good um, about where OKC is and, and about what OKC is envisioning and doing with Cason Wallace because they do need 
a better bench score. They do need a better bench um, facilitator. For everything we just said about what Mitchish can do for Dub, Giddy, and Shea, Kaysen can do that too, um, and then will do that for OKC, frankly. So I'm pretty excited about the Kaysen Wallace pick. I did like Grady Dick a lot, and I, I think that Grady Dick would have been a perfect fit in OKC as well, but I, I think that that Wallace has more upside and checks more boxes than Grady Dick. I think that Grady Dick might have a more seamless um, envisionment, but upside wise and, and talent wise, you know, Wallace, I think was the right choice here. Uh, with that being said, how many players are on the hot seat for the Oklahoma city thunder after the draft, like after the draft is over, uh, who is on the hot seat, who is, um, you know, going to be needing a very good summer, frankly, to, to stick around. And of course the caveat was with this question. And I'll say the caveat here too, the caveat being, you know, from, uh, from Barry block, we like all these guys, you know, you got an attachment to all these guys, but someone has to go. And that, that is true. Someone has to go. It's hard because even as Keith Smith said, you know, and reported on our podcast last week, and I've said the same thing that the Thunder genuinely do like all these, all these guys in their roster. Like they like all these guys. They still believe in all these guys, but you draft two more players. One of them, of course, Kathy Johnson will be on a two way deal. Um, you, you, you bring back Davis Pertans who wouldn't really make sense to buy him out in the off season, in my opinion. So I think that he'll be here um, in October. And now you got to move on from somebody. You, you've got to move on from somebody. Uh, Lindy Waters has to be on the hot seat just based on the nature of, one, mechanically speaking, he's the easiest to move on from. You just decline the option. That's pretty much it. So uh, mechanically speaking, Lindy Waters would be on the hot seat. I think he's having a good summer. I think that the Thunder still really like him. And, and obviously Mark likes him. He plays him a lot. Uh, and when he can, and, and the Thunder like him, and they like his story, and he's a great story, great guy, everything else. Uh, but just in the business sense of who you can move on from the clear roster spot, he is the easiest pathway to do that. And we thought that that was going to be what happened to him as well as happened to Eugene Omarui whenever they converted to Eugene uh, and then waived him a couple of, of days later um, from signing him to a standard deal from a two-way deal. So we figured at the time that the Lindy Waters conversion was a sweetheart deal. It probably still is, uh, you know, to be frank about who's on the hot seat. It's probably Lindy Waters just based upon um, how easy it is to move on from him. Trey Mann for sure is on the hot seat and his hot seat is different. I think um, maybe, you know, he survives the whole summer and, and he'll be on the roster in October. Don't, don't take that as coming back and saying, Oh, we'll see. He was on the hot seat. I think no matter what happens with him, no matter if he gets cut traded or is on the roster in October in OKC, no matter what happens, he's on the hot seat because this is going to be his prove it year. If, if he is, on this roster come October, which I, which I would bet he would be if he is on this roster come October, he has to prove it. Like he has to play really well because you have case and Wallace, you have all these guys that, that you're, that you're selecting over him. Like at this point, you know, you're going to invest more in case and Wallace this summer, or this um, season than you do in, in Trey man. Like you, you don't take a top 10 guy uh, at the same position as Trey man. And then just be like, well, we're still going to nurture Trey man and prioritize Trey man. No, you've shifted your priority over case and Wallace. So, with Trey Mann, like you've got to really impress and really, really take a leap. And that's common to happen. Like, like year two to three leaps happen all the time. And I, and from everything that, you know, we've seen, he's been having a good summer, but you got to actually do it. You've got to actually kind of materialize that at the moment. So Trey Mann on the hot seat for sure. Uh, and then I think that for most people, Jeremiah Robinson Earl is on the hot seat, but I think people forget like how quality Jerry is. And like, because he played hurt last year, after that ankle sprain, like because he played it hurt and uh, didn't, never really looked the same for most of the year, uh, people forget like he's he's a quality NBA player. And, and the sad part is, like you mentioned in the question, the sad part is like somebody has to go and and, and not everyone's going to survive this rebuild. But there are going to be players who who don't survive the rebuild but are but are very important rotational pieces for other teams. And Jeremiah might fall into that role. Um, as well, our, our next question at Jaden underscore. Bordis, what are you expecting from Isaiah Joe and, and Aaron Wiggins long term? So, long term is kind of a tricky definition. So let's let's take it and do it layers wise. These two guys are going to be very important pieces for the rotation to win games next year. Like like to me, to win games next year and to maximize winning, you need to play Isaiah Joe a lot. You need to play Aaron Wiggins a lot, and that that is first and foremost very important. Long term, as in like two years, three years, four years from now. These could be players who are used 
you know, as, as sweeteners and deals or who are just moved on from, frankly, because of the, the roster turnover and the roster crunch. And they might get left behind in two or three years uh, and have fantastic careers elsewhere for themselves and, and, and really impact winning elsewhere. But in terms of the short term of like this specific season, to me, come October, you're going to need to have Joe and Wiggins be, be kind of staples of your rotation uh, because you're not going to have better options in the bench, you know, on the bench that can impact winning than these two guys. With that being said, the caveat is, hey, you're going to have to figure out how to how to thread the needle until the line of still developing your 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 prospects, but also trying to win. And Joe and Wiggins, while they don't have that developmental edge to them, they do have that winning edge to them. So how do you how do you toe that line? How do you walk that line? Uh, at Ben Glover says Butler and Osar is are they going to be taking up the other two ways as Keontae Johnson is on a two way? So uh, Jared Butler and Olivia Sar are uh, restricted free agents, so they are not on two ways right now. Only Keontae Johnson is. The Thunder have two open two way spots to use, however they choose. Uh, I would I would be fairly shocked if Jared Butler was not brought back, considering uh, the way that they picked him up last year. Now. You know, when I say shocked, I wouldn't just be distraught or like jaw dropped and can't believe it. It's more so like if I saw they didn't bring him back, I'd be like, hmm, all right, I guess I guess they didn't bring him back. It's just kind of a shock like that. But um, yeah, they have two open two open two way spots, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of these guys that um, that they've been taking in on the undrafted free agent route entering summer league don't fill the two way spots. Like I, I like Jared Butler a lot. I think that Jared Butler. Um, can fill one of the three two-way slots, uh, especially between him and Saar. However, with that being said, I think that a, a great option for this, a great option for um, that two-way slot, one of them would be Caleb McConnell from Rutgers, one of the best defenders in the class. And so we know that you know playing defense matters and and stashing him in the G League and maybe, maybe some spot minutes in the NBA – could be interesting. Uh, Adam Flagler, another one from Baylor that they brought in, uh, shot forty percent from three and kind of fits that Jared Butler mold. It's kind of it's Adam Flagler is kind of Jared Butler, only like a newer model of Jared Butler. It's it's like if you get the iPhone fourteen versus the iPhone thirteen, like they're practically the same thing, but like one's a newer model. Adam Flagler could could be that out of Baylor to take uh, Butler's spot on a two way. But yes, to answer your question, as of right now, only one of the three two way slots is filled, and it's filled by Keontae Johnson. I'd be interested to know if the if the Kathy Johnson two way is like a multi year two way, if it's a one year two way, what's kind of kind of going on there uh, with with a fiftieth overall pick. But nonetheless, we'll talk about that more coming up. But first, go check out Locked in NBA Big Board. We're back, Locked On Thunder Podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, we are diving into your mailbag questions. This one from at Michael Stark underscore 23. When do you think the Thunder will add more veterans? So this question is going to be talked about a lot this summer, next summer, and forever. To me, it's unfair to want them to do this right now. Like I think that this off season, you should just take it, take it, take a beat, right? I know that we're all concerned about what the next steps are and everything else. Take a beat and understand this roster is not going to be perfect in October. It's going to have flaws. It's going to have uh, ways to improve, and that's okay. Like that's the plan. The plan is for this roster to have ways to improve in October. I think it's unfair to expect them to to go all in and make it the perfect roster this this summer because. It's hard to make the perfect roster when we haven't seen these guys play. The only top five pick of this rebuild has not played a single minute for the Thunder and like in the NBA in general. And so I think that this summer, maybe make a move on the margins. I don't think you make a, make a big splash. I will say this though. After the end of this year, no matter what happens, if they win 35 games, if they win 45 games, if they win 55 games, no matter what happens, win total aside, I don't care if they win if they win 30 games, some just dramatically bad number, or if they win some fantastic number. Next summer, if fans begin to want the Thunder 
and clamor for the Thunder to make a big move, it's it's going to be hard to to say that they're wrong, right? Because at that point, you'll have seen um, your core play. You're you're going to have a feel. It won't be perfect, but it never is. It won't be perfect. You won't have a perfect feel for what you need, but you'll have a better feel for what you need. The the, the extension windows on these guys will start to open up, and the clock will start to tick, and the clock will start to tick on SGA, like. The bottom line is SGA is only signed through the 2026-27 season. And to this point in history, guys typically do not stay much longer than they have to uh, with OKC uh, after the conclusion of their of their max contract that you get off your rookie deal. So you can really only bank on operating in this four-year space. And so we're going to take this year to kind of measure out what happens with the score. That's fine. And I totally agree with that. Then you have three more years left um, to, to, to figure out how to maximize Shea and the rest of this core. So uh, I think that next year, like the, at this time, you know, at this time next year, or at the draft next year, if you are clamoring for the Thunder to go kind of quote unquote all in, it'd make more sense. I, I would be more on board with it at that point than I am right now. Right now I'm still in the camp of you just got to wait. You just got to be patient. You just got to let things unfold and don't make anything. Don't do anything dramatic. But after this season, that's going to be very hard to continue to walk that line. So not this summer, but next summer, I think, is whenever you can start to see them make sort of a big move. Uh, at SSN New Jersey Devils, how do you view Cason Wallace uh, in the rotation and non-Thunder OKC fans are suggesting to trade Lou Dort? Uh, what about you and why? So Cason Wallace, I think, will, in this season, shore up your secondary unit, be a scoring, defending, ball-handling guard that really helps out your your roster and, and 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 is a guy that you feel comfortable passing the baton to. I think it'll be a guy like J-Dub. We're like, J-Dub didn't play with the blue and he was just from, from the gates played an important role for the Thunder. I think that Cassano also did the same thing. He'll play an important role for the Thunder and he probably will never step foot um, in a blue jersey. And so that's what I expect from him for this year. Um, in terms of the national sentiment around trading Dort, yes, Eventually, trading Lou Dort would make sense because we understand that in order to make a big move, you can't just overwhelm teams with only draft picks. You're going to need to give them something. And Lou Dort, at least, is that something that makes sense uh, and that teams would want, along with a, a bounty of first round picks. However, I don't think that this is something you do like tomorrow or you do like next week. I, I don't think it's something that you do in a year from now. Like I think that I think that the the benefit of having Ludor is uh, is multifold. Number one, you want to make sure he can mentor you know Kasan Wallace and, and make him you know as, as good of a defender as he can be. And, and Wallace has talked about how he wants to go on the floor with Ludor and, and wants to learn from him, one of the best defenders in the league. So you want to make that happen. Number two, I think that people don't understand how important Ludor is to the locker room, how important Ludor is to bring the intensity every single night and helping this roster night in and night out uh, survive a marathon season. And also, you know, having him play a role in, it helps your depth. Like if he's your starting, if he's your starting, you know, small forward, then everyone else kind of moves down a peg to where now you, you have the luxury of, of depth and, and the luxury of just like constantly throwing out lineups that, that are really quality players versus, consolidating that and not having as much depth. And I think that people don't understand also this contract for Lou Dort is going to look fantastic. It's going to look fantastic as the new media rights deal kicks in and the salary numbers go up. It's, it's going to look like a bargain contract pretty soon. Uh, pretty, It's going to look a lot closer to that bargain contract that he was on before uh, than not uh, once this new media rights deal comes in and the, and the cap goes up. And so with all that being said, I think that that's the kind of the case for, um, for, for keeping Dort, especially for the next couple of seasons. With Lou Dort, it just cannot be undersold also how much better he's going to look this year. Like I, I am very confident that this year he'll cut down on the bad shots. He'll cut down on having to do too much. And he'll be put more in a defined role offensively that allows him to thrive. And by, by product, the percentages will go up, the numbers will go up, and, and, and your feelings of him will go up as well on the offensive end. And we saw what he can do in the playoffs. Like he, he's, a, he's a playoff player. Like he's a guy that performs well in that setting. Speaking of playoffs at Kev will with the thunder avoid the plan. I think that they will. I think that the Thunder team will avoid the plan. 
I, I know the Western Conference is tough. I know that the Western Conference is like incredible, but I love the starting lineup of SGA, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams, and Chet Holmgren. Then you 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 go from that to hey, here's here's Kesson Wallace, here's Isaiah Joe, here's Aaron Wiggins, here's Kenneth Williams, here's Jalen Williams out of Arkansas, and then you still have. Trey Mann, Pokashevsky, Usman Jang, Davis Bertans to mix in. And whenever you have those quality of players to mix in, that allows you to hold up for an 82-game stretch. Like, this is a marathon of a season. This season lasts year-round, practically, because by the time Summer League ends and the dust settles on Summer League and free agency, you'll have, like, a month off, and then, boom, it's media day, it's training camp, and here we go. So, like, it's hard. It's it's hard to survive, just, just frankly, survive a season. And, and having these guys helps you do that to where we've seen that this Thunder team takes the regular season seriously versus other teams. And they have a path, I think, to being good enough to be a six seed or better. Here's the caveat, though. That should not be your expectation. They could do that. Like, they could be a top six seed in the West. That, that's, not, that's not irrational. That's not homerism. That's not silly. That's not, like, that's not like outlandish. But if they don't do that, if they fail to reach that plateau, right, and they don't and they don't get there, they don't get to a top six seed. That does not mean that this is a failure. That does not mean that like they didn't they didn't play to to expectations or to or, or, or they failed, because it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. You're working in Chet Holmgren, you're working in Case and Wallace, you're working in all these guys like Jalen Williams trying to stay, take a step up and trying to evolve. Josh Giddy take another leap, trying to evolve. You know, you're, you're trying to find rotational minutes to develop Poku and Jang and Trey Mann. And, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Plus, you never know what injuries happen or whatever. But um, they could, they could avoid the plan for sure. And, and and I would predict them to do that. But again, I wouldn't hold them to doing that. If that makes sense. Uh, at John S A nineteen sixty two, is there a history of guys getting a chance? after a great World Cup performance, and did the Thunder cover such an event? Number one, yes. I think the Thunder will be watching the World Cup and scouting the World Cup and collecting data on the World Cup. Number two, I don't know if there's ever been a case where like someone, like the direct reason why you got a shot, the one-to-one reason of why you got a shot in the NBA was because you dominate the World Cup, but it, it obviously doesn't hurt. And I think that NBA teams will be watching, of course, the World Cup, not only for their own players, but like you said, for scouting, just, just to keep tabs on guys um, along the way. At Obey underscore the dope, do you think OKC needs to pair someone next to Chet or let him run the five first? The Thunder are going to let Chet run the five first. The Thunder are not going to be predictive of what they do or don't need, They're, and they want Chet to be a center. And I also think that that's the right move. I, I think that letting Chet be the center, letting Chet run the five this year is the right move because whenever you, whenever you envision like this five-out offense – it is really exciting for what, what Mark can do with this offense, not to mention the defensive side of the floor, but specifically offensively. And, and you want to talk about ways to, to you know, attack Jokic, attack and beat, attack these guys. It's that five-out offensive look uh, that, that can maybe give them trouble. So I'm interested to see kind of what that looks like in the future and uh, this season specifically. And we'll get our first glimpses at all this uh, in summer league, uh, Half the roster is going to play in summer league. It feels like because they're still so young. Like it's incredible how young they are. That like a lot of your main guys are still playing summer league games. Uh, but we'll see that in about seven days. So on tomorrow's show, we'll piece together that summer league roster. On tomorrow's show, we're also going to take the rest of your mailbag questions. Uh, and throughout the week, we're talking. Kaysen's fit with OKC. Keontae's with OKC. I think that he's not getting enough credit for how good he might be as a rookie. Uh, and everything else moving forward. So make sure you stay tuned to Lockdown Thunder. We're here for you every single day uh, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.